little stool so that you can see me. Um, hi, I'm Liz Thompson, National Education Manager for Genomi Canada. And uh, today we are going to do an Instagram Live on the serger and the cover hem. And um, I am going to make a pair of leggings or a pair of pants because I don't, I don't make the legs of my leggings that narrow. Um, it's just 10 a.m. now, so I'm not actually going to start with the uh, content until um, maybe a minute has passed, just to give you time to get on to this Instagram Live. Um, in the interim, um, I just wanted to mention that um, on Thursday, we have another Instagram Live um, with Erin, and she is going to talk about Autistic Digitizer software. Um, so that's coming up on Thursday. But please note that the time will not be 1 p.m. Eastern. It's actually going to be 3 p.m. Eastern because we are doing a focus group um, online with almost 100 people on Thursday morning. And um, Erin is involved in that. So I didn't want her to literally have the two sessions back to back. I wanted to give her a little bit of time between the two, uh, the online class and the Instagram live to just clear the decks and prepare and get ready for the next one. So 3 p.m. Thursday, and that is on our Genomi Life um, schedule that we published um, yesterday morning. Okay, so without any further ado, it is now uh, two minutes past 10. So hi, Celine. And um, you can ask me questions during this live. Um, and I hear other educators complaining about the fact that they don't have any help. I have never ever had anybody hold a camera for me or answer questions for me in a live. I do it all myself. There's nobody here but me. So um, the uh, camera is facing the um, surges right now because that's really what I want you to see. So in order to see questions you ask me, I have to hop up from the surger and come around to the back of the iPad or to the iPad screen so that I can see those. So if you just give me a chance during the um, live, I will try and answer questions. I'll scroll through them and see if there are questions asked, but I may not answer you immediately. Okay. Um, one of the things that I want to talk about right now before I turn the camera is, well, actually I do have to turn the camera. So let me do that. All right. Here is my very favorite quick sew pattern. Now, um, that doesn't mean um, that you have to use this pattern. In fact, I wouldn't even know if this pattern is still available. It may be out of print. Um, I've had this pattern probably for close to 20 years. Um, I will tell you, and I'm going to explain that in a minute. It is a yoga pant pattern. But because of the choice of the fabrics that I use to make my pants, um, th and I have made alterations to the pattern, nobody who sees me wearing the pants that I've made would even dream that I was actually wearing a yoga pants pattern. Um, you'll notice that those pants and the first one that I made in the red pants many, many years ago, I did it as the pattern. However, those legs were quite, the, the your pant legs were rather wide and I don't like it like that, nor do I like that capri kind of thing. And I think that's a bit stupid for yoga anyway, because when you're lying on the floor and you've got your legs in the air and you're breathing and all the rest of it, those pant legs fall down or come back up your leg towards your hip. So I don't think that's practical. I think tight leggings are much better for yoga. Any event, the point is, uh, this is the pattern that I've used. You don't have to use this pattern, but what I'm highly suggesting you do is that you get a um, pattern that you like and try it out. Many times I'll try a pattern out on a fabric that I don't really care very much about, and then I'll try it on for size, and I'll know that if it's bunching around the, the buttocks or it needs to be taken in a little on the side seams or other alterations, I will then know, and I'll make those alterations for the second time I make it. Alternatively, of course, you could completely 
um, alter that you could actually alter the pattern and then you could make a um, what's the word I want uh, a, 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 you make a trial version of it um, which you're never going to wear and, and you try that out for size quite frankly I can't be bothered doing that I just make one in fabric that I don't particularly like and if it doesn't fit me well I just toss it to the thrift store okay so now what did I do with this pattern that changed it substantially so you need to forgive my my pattern it's pretty well used as you can see now you will notice that if you look back at this pattern that the waistline on the gray ones view a is quite low and I do not like my pattern my pants to be that low so what I did was I added a piece onto the top of my pattern. I simply extended it with a piece of uh, pattern trace or whatever you want to call that stuff. And I think this was called Swedish tracing paper. And then I simply taped it onto the top. But now I had the matter of the legs of the uh, pants. And uh, if you, if you, like I said to you, they were too wide on those red pants. Now, if um, you, you're going to want to make them narrower, um, you could, but I don't recommend it, take it, it, take your seam in on the inseam or the side seam. But when you do that, you actually alter the integrity of the pattern. And then you're going to wonder why it's creeping here and, and moving there and twisting here and you won't like the fit. So what I did, you can see this straight grain all the way up the middle of the pattern. I cut it, I sliced it literally from the bottom of the pattern all the way up to almost the waist. And then I basically cantilevered or overlapped those two halves of my pattern and narrowed the leg of the pattern considerably. And um, I think I did it twice until I got it to about the, the width of the pants that I like. And now this pattern is looking so dilapidated that I'm very soon going to have to place it on some pattern trace and cut myself a whole new pattern. All right. So the next thing I want to show you is, um, and I'm hoping you can see it. It's very hard because my arms aren't long enough to stretch far enough away. But this is a very soft cotton knit that I had and I made it into a pair of, of leopard skin pants. I do kind of like things like that. Um, they are not exactly leggings because if you look here, the legs are not skin tight. Um, I wear these around the house um, uh, and I do like to put elastic at the top. Um, I could fold it over and make a, a, a casing and put my elastic in the casing but I actually like to add this plush elastic it's probably two two and a half inches wide I buy it like that and um, it's soft and it's got almost like a velour sort of feel to it so it doesn't scratch the waistline it's beautiful it is fairly pricey but I buy it whenever I see it I buy several meters of it because it's not that easy to find I have a couple of stores that stock it and whenever I go there I buy, I think the last time I went I bought 10 meters of it. So that's what I like to use for the waistlines and I will show you later how I do that. But I also like to do something down my side seam and that is um, a top stitching. Now I don't have to do that but I really like it when my seams lay flat. So after I have surged Let's move it into the camera so you can see. After I have surged my side seam, I press it flat if it needs it. And then I move the surging to one side. As you can see there, the surging seam went to one side. And then on the right side with my sewing machine, I come by and I do a top stitching. I'll show you on one of the other samples a bit later, uh, or a couple of the other samples, some other options. But what I used here was a sort of mustard colored thread and it was quite thick. I believe it was a 28 weight thread. You're going to probably need a top stitch needle for that. And I just used a regular straight stitch that I elongated to, I think it was three and a half or four. 
You can use a triple straight stitch as well, but please test it on your fabric first. Because I tried a 12 weight thread to start with and it was terrible. It was just chomping the fabric because both the thread and the needle were much too thick for this very soft, thin cotton knit. So always test things out, but I do like that little top stitching along the edge. Okay. So without any further ado, what we're going to do now is we are actually going to make a pair of pants. So what I've done is I have cut out uh, my pattern. There's a back piece and a front piece and I have altered the pattern as I showed you. And then um, I have cut out two fronts and two backs. Now, a little word of warning, and I'm hoping you can see this. This happens to be a scuba knit. And if you look at both sides of it, it's very, very difficult to see which is the right side and which is the wrong side. So trust me on this one. Once you have cut out your pattern pieces, get one of those clips. I'm just going to reach for it and show you what I mean. These uh, clover clips, this is what I use almost exclusively with my serger. I try not to bring pins anywhere near the blade of my serger because I'm going to cause big trouble if I do happen to cut over a pin. So I can't cut over these clips. I have to remove them before I get near the blade. So what I'm suggesting you do is take one of these clips and clip it up near the top on the waistline of the back of your um, pants. So there'll be two back pieces, so you'll have a clip on either of the two back pieces. I highly recommend you do that because otherwise you're going to have happened what's happened to me a couple of times and literally, other than unpicking the entire pair of pants, I would I just threw them in the bin. So uh, you, it, it, if you go wrong and you put the wrong side to the right side, and you, you mix up your fronts and your backs, you are going to have a crutch seam that will not fit or match up at all. And as I say, ask me how I know this. So here we have my uh, front and back. So what I did was I have done this side seam. I sewed it with my serger in brown thread. And my serger, by the way, I am using the Janome FA4 uh, serger that is a two three four thread serger and just a quick little um, uh, notice for you that uh, lots and lots and lots of our machines are out of stock um, because of the pandemic the pandemic has had people buying sewing machines like we haven't seen since 2008 when we had that uh, huge uh, Actually, no, it wasn't that. It was after, I'm getting mixed up. It was after 9-11 when everybody cocooned and stayed at home. Well, we have not seen sewing machines sold in the numbers since then. Um, and quite honestly, none of the sewing machine companies have got very much inventory. But we do have inventory of this serger. And it is being sold tomorrow, well, actually from tonight, 10 p.m. Eastern, on the shopping channel. So if you are in the market for a serger, have a look at the shopping channel. You can also check with your local Janome dealer because some of them may have inventory of this serger. I got it recently. It's a relatively new one. We probably only had it for about a year and I am loving this serger. It threads beautifully. For example, if I show you on the inside here, there is a little, um, let me just raise the needles up. And if I flick that there, do you see, I hope you can see, uh, let me just zoom in. Can you see that there is a little hook there? And uh, that little hook helps you to um, thread your lower looper. So this is an absolute breeze. Even though it's not an air threading serger, it is a really, really nice serger. And it will let you do two thread serging as well. So as I say, I have done my side seam uh, on these pants. And if you look here now, you'll see there is my uh, back crutch seam and there is my front crutch seam. And what I then did was I took it to my sewing machine and I did a top stitch in brown thread over my seam. So that's laying really nice and flat now. 
So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to serge the inseam. Because I knew that I was going to be talking and telling you hints and tips, I did some of the steps ahead of time uh, in the interests of saving time and keeping you here for an hour. When I'm not talking, I can actually make one of these pants after it's been cut out, of course. Cutting out, I'm not counting that part, but after it's been cut out, I can sew up one of these pairs of pants in probably 15 to 20 minutes. Done. With elastic and my hems, everything. Um, so I actually recently, while my husband was watching the golf, I stood at my dining room table and I cut out, I think, nine or ten pairs, new pairs of pants. And I tossed a whole lot out to the thrift store and I had a blast cutting out things while he was watching television because I was not interested in the golf. So as you can see, I am sewing down my seam. I'm not worrying about tiny little irregularities. You may have noticed there was a little sort of bump there with my cutting because as I go through, the blade of my serger is evening that all out and cutting off, as you can see there, a small little slice of my uh, fabric. Now, a word about sizing and seam allowances. You need to look at your pattern and you need to find out what the seam allowance is on your pattern. I have done that many moons ago, so long ago that I think I've almost forgotten what I actually did. But uh, I think my pattern has got a um, 5 8 seam allowance. In fact, you, I, I have actually forgotten. I can't remember what it is. But I know that quite a number of the Jali patterns, and Jali uh, is a Canadian pattern company based in Quebec, and uh, they, a lot of their patterns, not all of them, but a lot of their patterns are one centimeter seam. So what you need to do is figure out, if I'm going to do cut size medium, say, and I'm going to have a one centimeter seam allowance, my, my um, s stitching of the serger is not one centimeter. So I need to take that into account and either cut my pattern smaller or larger, or I can make use of these little um, measurements, it's sort of like a seam guide on my serger and the various sergers have got those. There are also lines on your needle plate that you can use as well, although once this is underneath there, you don't see the needle plate. So I happen to know that if I cut out a size small, because I am sewing a narrower seam, that then gives me just what I need for a medium size. Okay, so now you will see that I have got my pant leg sewn and I just want to step back to see the camera. And while I'm at it, um, I'm going to scroll back and see if there are any questions that any of you have asked. Um, don't think so. If I've missed one, I apologize. Just send me a message on uh, Instagram or YouTube or Janome Life or uh, Facebook and I will be happy to answer you but I don't think I missed a question there. So here we are as I say my arms are not long enough to show you the whole pant leg but that has been done and it is right sides together because I was sewing the seam. Now I have got another pant leg that I had already done. All right there is my inseam or the inner seam down the, the inside of my leg that's already done and I've turned it to the right side all right there's my seam on the wrong side here's the right side what I now do is I put it inside the other leg that I have just sewn and I'm going to take it away from the screen just so that I can get it done and then bring it round here and show you it's little bit of a fiddle when you're doing this in the air. Normally I'm sitting and I'm doing it on the table or on my lap. But what I want to do is I want to match my crutch seam. So in other words, this is where the two leg seams come up and join in that sort of special private place. All right, so here we are. I'm going to put a clip there, having matched up those seams. And what you can do is you can uh, put the one seam going to the left and the one seam going to the right. And then what I usually do is I come and I clip 
all the way along that seam up to the top of the back. All right, there it is. And then I do it the other way, going the other way. I clip those two uh, crutch seams all the way along to the other side. Right, I'm going to put that aside now and I'm going to pick up another pair of pants that I have already made and I have already done that clipping so that we're not bouncing around in midair. There I have it all clipped and ready to sew the crutch seam. So up till now, I've done two side seams. I've top stitched them both and then I did the two inseams and now I'm going to do the crutch seam. Now I shouldn't really be using brown thread on this grey sort of microfiber fabric. It's going to show but what I'll do later if the brown needle thread is showing through too much I will unpick it and redo it but I have brown thread in there for the other pants, so I'm not going to change that now. I'm simply, do you see how I can't go over that? If it was a pin, I might be tempted or lose concentration and go over the pin. Here I can't because I have to stop when I get to the clips. Now these clips are, where Janome doesn't sell them, but they are wonderful. Some people I think call them magic clips. Um, there are probably various brand names for them. Um, I, I sort of kind of bit the, bit, bit the bullet and bought several sets of them. Um, they're not that cheap, but honest to goodness, I use them all the time. They were well worth the uh, investment. And as you can see, there I have my little dish of clips uh, that I have accumulated over a period of time. And now I am right at that where the two seams intersect. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to check that my one seam is going towards the back of the serger and this top seam is coming towards me because that reduces a little bit of the bulk at that intersection. And then around I go again, keeping going all the way around. And this is a longer seam from that intersection so I know it is the back of my pants so I'm heading up for the center back of my waist and there we are so there is my seam as you can see the brown thread actually it's not that bad and if I open it out on the front actually you know what I think I'm going to get away with that I'm not going to need to unpick that and redo it in a gray thread at all in fact a gray thread may show through more than the brown is on this it's got a slightly different color now I'm not actually sure whether that microfiber sort of feel was the right side of the fabric or whether this was the right side of the fabric but I really like the feel of this microfiber against my skin really hard to try these on at the moment because it's been really hot but once winter hits us I know that I'm really going to enjoy uh, wearing these uh, pants so there is my crutch seam now all that remains of these pants is to sew the elastic around the top of my uh, waistband or the waistline and to do the hems down at the bottom of my pants so I have got another one ready to show you. Uh, there is my elastic that um, I have got all ready. And actually, no, I'm not going to do another one. The other one that I have there is, is for the hemline. So what I'm going to do now, and I'm hoping that you are going to see, because this is going to be really difficult for me to stand up, but you'll see that I'm using that gray plush elastic again and I have joined it in the middle. So measure your waistline and then overlap it by about an inch. And then I usually use my sewing machine to sew that together. And I probably should have used a gray thread, um, but I used a blue so that it would be a little bit uh, easier for you to see. And I used that elastic stitch on the machine, the one that's got um, several stitches in a zigzag. Um, I find that very successful and I just go backwards and forwards with my reverse button and sew that together and then I match it to the front and put a clip and then I put those two clips together and put clips on the other. So basically I've quartered the elastic. Now my pants, 
in fact I'm going to turn it out to the right side that is better and um, here we have uh, the pants and obviously uh, that's the front and this is the back so what I'm going to do and I'm going to try and do this in the air standing in the air here um, I may not end up pinning the whole of it where is my join there's my join all right so what I'm going to do is I am going to put this um, uh, piece of um, and I need some pins let me just grab some pins quickly okay there's always something that you forget so what I'm going to do is I am going to uh, actually do it from the right side so let me turn it around wow this is hard doing it standing with it holding it in the air all right I'm doing it from the right side and I'm taking the pin and I'm going to put it into the elastic so if you look at the back do you see that I've got I've basically probably pinned down a little more than a quarter of an inch but I would have tried this on before I sewed the elastic just to check that uh, this fabric wasn't coming too high and giving me too high a waist because if I then sew my elastic and put the pants on and the elastic is at my waistline and I didn't cut off some fabric maybe at the top here it might be that my pants will be baggy and it'll look like I'm taking my lunch in my pants to work which won't won't look pretty at all so here is the next one I'm going to come here and put a pin in and then I can take that out and I keep going around to each of the seams there's the next seam there and I'm going to put the elastic there and get another pin and put it into I'm looking at the camera and not at the garment it's it's like really weird it's like looking in the mirror and trying to do something in real time all right so I think you get the idea that is how I pin my elastic to the waistline and uh, then I take it to my sewing machine now I could do this on the uh, cover hem I could come here and I could stitch a two thread or a three thread cover hem along there to attach the elastic to the pants now depending on your particular figure you may have a teeny tiny little waist in which case you're probably going to be stretching your elastic um, no you'll be stretching your fabric to meet your elastic okay I don't stretch my my elastic terribly much on these pants the the, uh, the elastic is only just a little bigger than than the pants fabric but the pants fabric is a knit and so if I did need let me just get to there all right do you see there is a slight ripple there so obviously as I'm sewing I just pull it flat and stitch it down and stretch the elastic very slightly as I sew right so with the magic of television we have one that has been stitched already so here is another pair of pants that has been done and there is the elastic you can see if I come up close can you see there is my little elastic stitch that I really like I would not sew this with a straight stitch on my machine because it's going to pop uh, if I stretch or do something energetic in these pants I could find that that straight stitch will pop because I'm dealing with a stretchy elastic and a stretchy uh, cotton knit fabric so I use that uh, stretch stitch or elastic stitch and it's very successful so I also wanted to show you on these pants what I did on the side seam I hope you can see it do you see that I used a decorative stitch instead of that straight stitch or a triple straight stitch to top stitch my side seam um, I'm not altogether sure that I like this fabric very much do you see that it's showing through it's obviously printed onto this gray fabric and uh, when, when you, where you've got seams and there's a little bit of pressure on the fabric that gray is showing through my red and blue print on the fabric but you know what it was cheap fabric that I bought somewhere and I'm not worried about it I will wear them at home and they will be just fine okay so um, let me show you another uh, pair of pants 
This one has got a different treatment at the top. Instead of using that plush elastic, which I literally sewed down on the top of the pants, on this particular one, what I did was I put the elastic along the top of the pants and I surged it all the way along that edge, doing the same thing with quartering the elastic and then pinning it to match side seams and center front and center back. And then once I'd surged that, I flipped the elastic over to the back, which is why you don't see any elastic. It's now effectively encased in my fabric. And then I came through and on the front, I did that elastic stitch. Let me get the focus right. Uh, there you go. All right. So I then did that elastic stitch. And on the front, all you see is that final stitching. On the back, you see where I, I sewed it first and then second. If I had surged it, that's where that one would have been. All right. So I also wanted to show you on the side seam, I did something a little bit different um, to embellish it slightly. And what I used here, I'm just going to reach over and get it. I had some uh, narrow maroon colored ribbon that was very similar to the fabric color. And what I did was I laid that ribbon down on the fabric and did a little zigzag stitch over the top of it, just because I could and because it was a variation and something different. Okay, um, what I want to do now, and I'm going to need to move my serger, so let me unplug that and move the serger and pull the cover hem in. So let me just check that you can see the cover hem well enough. I think so. And while I'm standing up checking that, let me, yeah, that's, that's a little bit better. Let me just check that none of you have asked me any questions. Oh, I must be doing a good job of explaining things today. Nobody seems to be asking me any questions. All right, let's just scroll down to the bottom. Right, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the hems. You could use um, your sewing machine to do a hem, um, but I really, really like using knit fabrics. I would say that probably about 90, 95% of my garment sewing is all on knit fabrics. And here is my hemline on a pair of navy pants. This is also a navy scuba fabric. I really like scuba. It does not pill. So I don't know about you, but some fabrics that I buy, because I, I don't have a budget that can run to very, very expensive fabrics. I have um, spent probably as much as 25 to 30 dollars a meter on some beautiful Ponty knits. Ponty is a really, really good fabric for pant. It's a pant weight, um, pants and jackets. And I have splashed out occasionally. And honest to goodness, it's been worth it because those um, pants are washed and worn and washed and worn and they're still lovely. Not a pill on them, nothing. When you buy very cheap what I call cheap and nasty fabric, and you really don't know what the composition is of the fibers in that fabric, they may wear out, uh, wash out, uh, pill and stretch. So this is one of the reasons why I really like uh, this kind of scuba fabric because um, it, it never pills and it washes and wears beautifully. I recently, when I was uh, going through my closet, threw a whole bunch of pants out to the, the, uh, the uh, thrift store and quite honestly, they, did, they hard, looked like they had hardly ever been worn. But I just was wanting to make room for new things. So what I did was I put the pants on and stood in a pair of shoes that I would be wearing with these pants so that you can get the correct hemline depth. And then I turned it up and then sat with my trusty little ruler. I love these little rulers for, for marking hems. And then on the back, I turned it up and used my little ruler to clip. And I just did four clips, you know, around the hem. I don't need an awful lot. And now I know that that is where I am. That's the depth of my hem. And I have my, um, sorry, I think I bumped the camera. Let's just see. Okay. My chair leg bumped the, the table that the camera is on. 
All right, so here I have my uh, cover hem, 1000 CPX. I'm going to take the free arm off the machine simply because it, it really does help when you are doing things like pant legs because I can put the pant leg into the free arm. What I usually do is I check where my inside seam is, and it's this one here, and I start and finish my seam somewhere there because people are not really likely to look at the inside of my ankle. If they are, they shouldn't be. All right, um, just to mention to, mention to you the Janome uh, 1000 CPX. This is a, a, a serger that, or a cover hem machine that I bought. Um, I've forgotten how many years ago. It must be easily eight or nine years ago. And I use it all the time. I never put it away. I just put the cover on it because it's fabulous. And uh, it's got all the bells and whistles that I need. They came out with the 2000 CPX and I haven't upgraded the machine to the 2000 CPX because I totally find this does everything for me that I need it to do. And just to mention to you, this is another machine that is being sold on the shopping channel from 10 p.m. Eastern tonight. So that's another one of the showstopper, Janome showstopper deals. You can, of course, also get a 1000 CPX from your uh, local Janome dealer provided of course they have inventory of it because I don't know whether we've got any in the warehouse we may we may not I'm not sure all right so what you what you will see that I've done is I have threaded up the um, cover hem machine with two threads one looper thread and two threads and I'm just going to open the door here to show you that the looper is so easy to thread because it flips back and there's only one looper it really 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 couldn't be easier and I have it positioned so that I'm going to ride my foot just a tad off the fold of my hem. And I have set it up for two thread wide because this is a fairly substantial knit. I don't want it to be two thread narrow. That's too narrow a hem for me. I want it two thread wide. I do occasionally do triple cover hem, but most times a two thread wide is more than enough for me. Now, I do want to mention something. Do you remember the, this leopard print uh, pants that I showed you earlier? You will see that I did a two thread wide uh, hem there as well. But this fabric, because it is so much thinner, I used Stay Tape. And Stay Tape is a product that is, is basically knit interfacing, cut into long strips and put on a roll. And I would definitely use stay tape on a thinner fabric because that way I won't get my, my uh, seam, uh, my cover hemming, uh, tunneling and distorting. But on the scuba, I don't really need it. The, the knit is quite uh, substantial enough. Now, here's a secret. I'm coming up to that side seam. So what I do, and I just want to check you can see it, I am flipping this little switch on my machine. It is known as a seam tightening system and as I go over that seam it tightens up my tension so that I don't get skipped stitches on the back once I've gone past the seam I can flip it back and carry on take my clip out and carry on and then keep moving it around this free arm which is such a handy tool to have now I'm coming up to the seam again the side seam so I'm going to go over that and then flip my switch back again and keep going all the way around all the way around and now I know uh, I'm sure you would have loved me to stitch this uh, seam in white thread but then what would have happened was I would have had to have unpicked it all afterwards because I wouldn't have wanted a white hem so I'm hoping let me look at the camera and see if I zoom in let me just see if I can zoom in really close I don't honestly know that you're going to see it on this navy thread but you might excuse the camera moving there um, let's give it a try what I'm doing is I'm coming up to where I started 
and I can see my stitching. You might just be able to see the stitching there. I'm going to line up that little mark on my foot and that little mark on my foot, which are perfectly in line with my two outer needles because I'm doing two thread wide. And I'm going to line those marks up with the stitching that I started with when I went around this. And I'm going to go for maybe half an inch. And then I'm going to take my tweezers and I'm going to move my fly wheel so that the needles are, are at the highest position. And I'm going to take my tweezers and just hook them around the threads. I'm then going to raise my presser foot. And the reason I do that before I raise the presser foot is because the ten uh, the um, there's not much space there for me to get my tweezers in. Now, do not cut the threads above the needle eyes because then you're going to end up threading the needles again. So I'm hoping you can see this. I'm going to now cut my threads and then I'm going to show you a very neat little trick. I take the fabric neat, uh, carefully in my hand and I just pull it to the back and the side, sort of basically like 10 o'clock. And then all I'm left with is my one looper thread to cut. So I cut that looper thread and what it's done, and let me just make sure I come up to the camera so that you can see. Oh, I don't know if the focus is right. Let me um, see if I can get it. It's really hard to see. I apologize, folks. What I'll do is I'll do a blog post on this and I'll take clear photographs and put them in the blog post. But what it did was it effectively, that little jerking motion took my um, two up needle threads to the back. And of course, my uh, looper thread was at the back. So I now have three threads at the back, which I can now um, do you, tie together. And so there I have them to tie together. And uh, you can use a bit of fray check if you want. But really, quite honestly, it's to do two or three little knots is quite enough. Okay, so there we have my hem. And obviously, I would do it on the other hem as well. And here is the one that I was showing you just now where we pinned the elastic. This one has been sewed on. And I did just a, no, I didn't have any top stitching on that side seam. And my hems have been done as well. There's my hem with the cover hem. And let me turn it to the back so that you can see what it looks like on the back. There is, I could have probably had a slightly darker gray fabric there, but I didn't have any. So I used uh, the, my darker gray fabrics on in my needles because that's what I was going to see. All right, so there we have pants. And honest to goodness, I can make a pair in 15 minutes. Um, if you've got any questions, you are very welcome to let me know. Uh, what could you do as an alternative to the cover stitch machine? Well, that's a very good question. Obviously, we'd love you to buy one of our cover hem machines. Um, but you, some people will use a twin needle. But really, in all honesty, I don't like using a twin needle because it doesn't have the same kind of stretch. If I was to take this hem here that I just showed you and stretch it like that, can you see that I am not popping any threads because a cover hem has got a beautiful amount of stretch in it. If you did that with a twin needle work, which is going to look a little bit like cover hem on the front, but that interlock stitching at the back is just your bobbin thread crossing over and grabbing the two top threads coming from the twin needle. It is not as stretchy, but it is kind of, it simulates this, but you may have to redo some hems if they pop. Another thing you could do is you could surge the bottom edge of your hem and then turn it up and do a blind hem with your sewing machine. Um, or you could just stitch down a straight stitch with your sewing machine. Again, a straight stitch has the um, tendency to pop when you, when you do it on a knit fabric. It's fine on a woven, but on a knit, if you stretch too much, it's going to pop that thread. So you could once again go back to one of your stretch stitches on your machine, like that elastic stitch there. 
um, that one is what they call um, the elastic stitch and it's got two or three little stitches in each zig and zag and uh, that's a good stitch to use for a hemline or one of your other stretch stitches you've got some on your machine that look like they they would be stretchy just try them out on the fabric that you've chosen for your pants let me just see if there are any other questions no it doesn't look like there are and so here we go 45 minutes you think it's going to take I told my husband it would be about 30 minutes but it's always longer than what it is just to let you know uh, that we are making some changes to these Instagram lives um, we have to now switch focus and concentrate on uh, online classes through our dealers stores and that's what we're going to be doing this fall um, I'm in the process of booking classes with dealers across Canada and I um, I therefore have to sort of take a little bit of a back step with these Instagram lives. So Erin will be doing an Instagram live on Thursday this week. Remember at the beginning I told you the time is different. It's going to be 3 p.m. Eastern. And um, that will be effectively the last one of our regular Instagram lives. Now having said that, I am going to do an Instagram live next Tuesday, same time, 1 p.m. Eastern, where I will talk about the new online classes um, that we'll be doing for our Genomi Canada customers at our Genomi dealer stores. Well, not at their stores. You'll be able to watch them from home on your computer or your mobile device, um, but they will be booked through your local dealer. So I will be explaining all of that next Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. But in terms of these twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, Instagram lives, we kind of have to f switch focus because we just, we just don't have the time to keep doing these lives. But what we will be doing is, and I will explain this next week as well, we are going to still be making videos and posting those to our Genomi Life YouTube channel. So for example, if there's a particular technique, like maybe you really want to see um, on a video, not a bouncy, shaky Instagram live where I'm trying to hold it as steady as I can and get the focus right. If you want to see how to make, let's say, a pair of leggings, I am more than happy to have a video set up and take that and put it on uh, our YouTube channel. That's the Genomi Life YouTube channel, where we've got probably nearly 100 videos there for you to watch now. So please let me know if there are topics that you want, and I'm more than happy to do that. But we do have 17, 16, 16 different topics, which I will go into much more detail with next Tuesday, that you can watch through your local Genomi dealer store. So that's what I'll be doing uh, next week. Um, Michael, I believe, is coming up tomorrow, uh, 1 o'clock Eastern on Genomi HQ, and he will be talking uh, about the changes that he is making to the Genomi HQ Instagram lives and what he is going to be doing uh, this fall and ongoing. And I think that's about it. Um, Thank you very much for watching and uh, I know that the pandemic is not completely over. I do desperately wish that it was because it's almost two years since I had my little grandson's hand in, in my hand. Uh, he lives in London, England and uh, had him look up at me and say granny in this very posh British accent. And I am, I'm in terrible withdrawal. I really want to see my little grandson. So I'm hoping that this pandemic is going to be over real soon so that we can start traveling again. Uh, not, of course, that I would get on a plane right now. But be that as it may, I know the pandemic is not completely over. But we are still available to you, even though we may not be doing these Instagram lives. Uh, we will be available to you on our Instagram page, our Facebook page, our Genomi Life comment box, and our YouTube uh, channel comment box. So we are not going anywhere. We are still available. So do keep contact with us and let us know what you need, and we'll try and provide that for you with our education support. So do make sure you tune in next Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, where I'll tell you all about the various different topics that we have on offer. We've got some really exciting stuff coming. Thank you all. Cheerio. Thank you.